Thank you, everybody, for um, tuning in tonight. Good evening. Welcome to CPA Presents. It's Monday, July 24, 2023. My name is Mike Kosalniak, and I'm the CPA Flight Safety Chair. Tonight's topic is Mid-Air Collision Physics, Gambles, and Myths. And our speaker is Mr. Robert Pat Levaney. Mr. Pat Levaney is a highly accomplished engineer with degrees in nuclear and mechanical engineering from Texas A&M. He built and flight tested his own aircraft, the KR-2 in 1981. As a system safety engineer at NASA, Space, uh, Marshall Space Flight Center, he received a prestigious silver Snoopy pin for his outstanding contributions to human flight safety. Mr. Pat Levaney's groundbreaking research on mid-air collision safety published in reputable journals has been widely validated by experts in the field. Uh, Robert, I wanna thank you very much for agreeing to come on to our CPA monthly presentation. Uh, it's an honor to have you and I'm very, very excited to listen to your presentation tonight. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, sir. I'm glad to be here, Mike. Uh, the, uh, the presentation that I'm showing tonight is an updated version of my January 31st, 2018 webinar for over 600 members of the Experimental Aircraft Association. It's uh, recorded in the archives and it's available for viewing by uh, folks who have current dues with the EAA. So um, the uh, picture in the dead center shows a KR2, uh, shows two KR2s, both of whom, one, the, one, the blue stripe on the left was mine and the white one was my hangar partners. We were flying in formation and almost had a mid-air collision with a with a uh, uh, Beach Super King Air in which we only had five seconds of visible time to impact. And uh, we managed to survive, but not by uh, any good bet. That was not a good bet that we would survive with only five seconds of visible time to impact. So, so I'll uh, go right on into the presentation. The goals of this presentation uh, explore the history of pilots using accurate obedience to unsafe regulations and practices that are designed to fail inadvertently so, I suppose, but uh, compared to far safer obedience to the relatively simple mathematics of primordial laws of physics controlling mid-air collision safety. So the problem is this, aircraft systematically cruising at common altitudes. So this problem goes back to the beginning of, of uh, mid-air collision disasters to over a hundred years ago uh, when, uh, when uh, a mid-air collision killed seven victims and mo mother nature not regulations constrained two scud running pilots to flying at one single common narrow cruising altitude between low clouds and terrains. So they had to fly below the clouds because they didn't have instruments and all that kind of neat stuff. And, and they didn't want to hit any, any uh, church steeples or trees or hills. So they had to fly, they only had one altitude available where they could fly and they just happened to run into each other and kill seven people. Okay. so. Um, not having instrument flying skills, uh, they were forced to, to fly in the same altitude in a fairly narrow band and they just kind of ran into each other. There was only, only one cruising altitude was possible. Now, if we had given some, now with a little high school math for coin flipping and dice tossing, we can show that how much safer these doomed 1922 single altitude pilots would have been if the clouds had been high enough to allow them to flip coins or throw dice to randomly pick from two to six, two or six available cruise, cruising altitudes, which you know, they didn't have, but this is just a hypothetical example. Logically extrapolating this trend from getting a 50% chance with two available cruising altitude rules to a one sixth chance of collision with six available cruising altitudes, we can see that that trend means that the, uh, the more cruising altitudes, the better. So uh, um, the, mid the mid air collision, that's so, so if you have few cr le legitimate cruising altitudes that you can use, you're in much greater danger. So only six years after the 1922 collision in 1928, an Australian mid air collision safety scientist whose name is lost in history used high school math to harness the safety of infinite random cruising altitudes to prevent recurrence of the 1922 mid-air collision, he created what I call the altimeter compass cruising altitude rule. So imagine a compass rose on the altimeter glass 
as a pilot aid for cruising at all possible altitudes, such that random headings measured on the magnetic compass would be matching, the, would become the alt altitude set point for the 100 foot hand of the compass measured on the compass rose on that compass rose glass. So, so in this way, the, uh, the 100 foot hand of the uh, altimeter uh, goes around once every uh, thousand feet of altitude and it measures 360 cruising altitudes for 360 degrees of possible heading angles. And what, what this ACAR formula from 1928 does is it allows head-on pilots to miss each other by 500 feet, but perpendicular pilots to miss each other by 250 feet. Closing at 25 degree angles gives an offset of 29 feet and closing at just a 10 degree angle gives an offset of 28 feet. All right, so here, is a, here are side-by-side -side and vertical views of how the 1928 idea allows five aircraft to safely and simultaneously cross a single waypoint at pseudo-random ACAR altitudes calculated from truly random headings. The red and yellow tracks match 25 degree closings that were fatal in the 1956 Grand Canyon collision, but they're not fatal here. As you can see, the red and green guys are gonna miss each other because of the 1928 ACAR idea. So ignoring the 1928 state of the art in collision safety science way back then, what are we doing better with 21st century ADSB, technically advanced aircraft cockpits and compulsively skillful flying? This FAA designated pilot examiner with 14,000 hours PIC and 8,000 hours as an instructor barely survived a mid-air collision in 2012 that killed an instructor, instrument instructor and the instrument student pilot that uh, she ran into. I watched her in-person Western Air Flight Academy presentation at Jeffco explaining her, try everything, never give up, strategy for getting her damaged aircraft to Longmont Airport for a survivable crash landing. After she was done, I asked her, what altitude were you flying at the moment of collision? With emphasis, she said exactly 7,000 feet uh, MSL, and she had a 10-minute-old home field barometric pressure measurement from the AWOS or ASOS at uh, Erie Air Park, where she lived. Obviously, both aircraft were accurately flown at a non-random common altitude of 7,000 feet, ignoring the random cruising altitude safety strategy first invented in 1928. Okay, 10 years later, a similar mid-air collision happened at exactly the same altitude for exactly the same reason, non-random altitudes. The blame the pilot NTSB report for, night, for 2012, uh, for the 2012 collision, failing to recognize the root cause of that collision, engineered the recur recurring identical accident 10 years later by having no lessons learned for safety information for pilots to avoid flying accurately at 7,000 feet. So remember the slide with the simulation image of five aircraft missing each other within the same thousand foot interval using ACAR? Imagine if you had 17 Boeing 787s accurately obeying ACAR coming from 17 equally spaced angles. Just like the pictures in the previous slide, they would automatically miss each other. And likewise, if you had a thousand simultaneously fly over a single waypoint from 1,000 equally spaced angles without colliding. Okay, here's an example of uh, quadcopter drones flying with a tremendous precision. These guys are all about a foot tall, flying a precision night show. This is the beginning of the show where they're all lined up in, in several uh, uh, planes of common altitude. Since they're controlled by computers, they're not hitting each other because they're, they're actually program to fly this, but imagine uh, two metal models of accurately flown drones comparing the safety basis of the 1928 ACAR formula against the hemispherical cruising altitude rules. Imagine 360 drones converging simultaneously from 360 equally spaced closing angles of one degree in each of the two adjacent thousand foot vertical intervals using ACARs. 
So uh, all 720 drones would survive without any mid-air collisions in this model using accuracy in that, in that picture from us just a couple of slides back. Now, if you use the same accuracy with, with uh, the hemispherical cruising altitude rules, you'd have 720 drones converging in a single 2,000 foot vertical interval from equally spaced heading angles with one degree closings with 180 drones converging simultaneously at four different legal HCAR cruising altitude rules, both VFR and IFR. And this would result in 100% of the ACAR obedient drones being destroyed at four different impact altitudes, two for IFR and two for VFR. So ignoring the 1928 um, Australian innovation, the FAA's 1945 predecessor, the Civil Aeronautics Board, CAB, enacted the quadrantal rule for fixed common non-random cruising at only four discrete fixed altitudes per 1,000 foot interval, per 2,000 foot interval, depending on flights headed in quadrants oriented northwest, northeast, southwest, southeast, and Wikipedia says that the uh, um, United Kingdom was using this quadrantal rule from 1945 up until 2015. So from 1945 until only 11 years later, the quadrantal, quadrantal rule authors managed to kill 128 in the Grand Canyon midair by pilots obeying the quadrantal rule for the, uh, for the Grand Canyon midair collision uh, and uh, the, the report actually says that they were obeying the quadrantral rule at the moment of impact. So um, doomed aircraft were cruising in the northwest quadrant with, with northwest quadrant headings, and they were flown with too much precision and skill uh, into a collision that had them at the same altitude. Uh, and this same altitude that they were flying was also for easterly headings, the same altitude that we would fly with uh, um, HCAR obeying the FAR 91.179. Uh, for easterly headings, these pilots would have also collided if they had have been flying with, uh, with HCAR. So, so they were dead two ways, with quadrantal rule or HCAR. Either way, they were guaranteed by design to run into each other on their northeasterly or easterly headings for those two rules. So the this 1956 CAB accident report includes the headings and altitudes required to correlate the quadrantal rule as a root cause for this accident. Then the sign it, it just gives you enough data to say, oh yeah, if they hadn't been doing that, maybe they would have missed each other. The CAB accident report authors then did what NTSB accident reporters do, reports do even now blaming the pilots for their naturally expected human physiological limitations while ignoring the well-documented culpability of the authors of the 1945 quadrant quadrantal rule, setting up the 1956 pilots for failure from being too accurately obedient to that formula designed to bring them together. Notice that the CAB preferred cure for this problem is more tax money spent on facilities and personnel for air traffic control. Have to ask you, is there a conflict of interest there here? Is the CAB spinning 128 deaths caused by pilots accurately obeying their quadrantal rule to divert attention away from the true cause for its own gain? From my Personal experience with root cause analysis dating to nuclear power plant accident analyses in the 1980s, NASA documented organizational factors as the definition of root causes in 2006. Organizational factors means organizations like NASA, CAB, FAA, not pilots. By my calculation, the two AR air aircraft by my calculation, two ACAR aircraft converging on the same 25 degree closing angle as the doomed 1956 Grand Canyon pilots would have had a 69 foot vertical offset. Subtracting half the height of each aircraft, even with gear down, which they weren't, in an ACAR safe clearance of 39 feet, which would have saved all those 128 lives. Compare that to the quadrantal rule engineering, the same altitude regulatory 
manu reg regulatory manufactured hazard that uh, killed those people. So the CAB Grand Canyon report failed to include the probable cause in the root cause documented on its own page nine comment about the quadrantial rule being obeyed at the moment of impact, which was inadvertently designed to cause that impact by having both aircraft at that common altitude instead of being at far safer random altitudes as proposed in 1928, already 28 years before that accident. So the blame the pilots took priority over coherent consideration of the evidence published within its own accident report of CAB rulemaking performance failing to incorporate the then state of the art in random altitude cruising safety science known since 1928 with ACAR. Okay, so how did the 1956 CAB accident report authors miss the fact that their own accident report documented the doomed pilot's obedience to the obviously flawed 1945 quadrantral rule? How did the 1963 FAA miss that its newly published hemispherical cruising altitude rules and FARs 91.159 and 91.179 would not only repeat the Grand Canyon mid-air collision by pilots obeying the new rule, but this new 1963 hemispherical cruising altitude rule would manufacture future more dangerous head-on collisions after 1963 that were forbidden by the significantly safer quadrantial rule that forbids head-on collisions. So here's a graphic of the quadrantial rule on the left and an H car on the right uh, set in a set in an altimeter scale, uh, while both Q, QR and, and H car allow only four legal cruising altitudes in every 2,000 foot altitude interval. The presumed newer, better, more modern 1963 uh, regulations actually adds head-on collisions that were impossible in 56, and uh, both regulations create danger, more danger for pilots flying with their altimeter 100 foot hands in the red zones here, if your 100 foot hand is up or down, you're obeying H car with tremendous accuracy and uh, you're gonna, you're looking for, for love in all the wrong places. So, so this supposedly newer, better hemispherical cruising altitude rule began manufacturing these head on collision dangers by design. And this particular design almost killed Dr. H. Paul Shuck in 2016. His survival and his status as a regular contributor to EAA safety, aviation safety webinars resulted in his comprehensively detailed account of how he was set up to fail by regulations designed inadvertently to kill him without even him sus suspect, suspecting the organizational root cause danger until my phone call minutes after the conclusion of his webinar. When I explained the problem, he said, Robert, you had to do a webinar. So um, before Dr. Shuck had his mid-air collision, uh, almost had a mid-air collision, chief scientist of the, of the Federal Aviation Administration, Robert McCall, twice in 1975 and in 1995, in two separate publications, published his thoughts on two ideas related to the FAA and I. KO, Organizational Root Causes for Mid-Air Collisions. Dr. McCall's too subtle whistleblowing about the navigation paradox and the 30 times increase in collision danger from head-on traffic required by H-CAR compared to 30 times safer same direction traffic under QR didn't exactly stick to the, all, to the wall when he threw, up, threw it up there in 1975 with his published articles about uh, North Atlantic uh, mid-air collision safety. So his navigation paradox is that sloppy pilots live longer. His 30 times danger increased at least argued for ditching the 1963 H car mistake to go back to the only slightly better, but still deadly 1945 QR regulation that at least forbidden head-on collision traffic. My title page at the beginning mentioned physics. So here is the physics from a formula even average high school math students can master. This 
mean free path formula was discovered by scientists shining light through dirty water in 1852. This, this, the, uh, the mean free path formula works for all kinds of collisions, including aircraft midairs. The simple, this simple equation calculates the mean or average distance that a point travels in a field of finite sized targets without having one collision. Without this formula, it's impossible to understand and calculate the fundamental factors affecting pilots gambling on their midair collision risk. This is the formula Vegas in the sky uses to send unsophisticated, unscientific, accurate, skillful pilots into smoking craters while sloppy pilots enjoy the blessings of the navigation paradox. Let's start with the area factor. It's in the denominator. The smaller your vulnerable area, the harder it is to hit you. And the longer your mean free path and the longer you'll live with a longer mean free path. Air airplanes seem to have a fixed size. Our piloting technique, airmanship, can change the effective size of your airplane. The mean free path formula is for very small points uh, traveling through uh, of targets of a certain size, Patchen's law is used with the mean free path formula for two objects like airplanes where both are much bigger than a point. I used Patchen's law with an AutoCAD model of head-on Cessna 182s with parallel and perpendicular wings. The per parallel wings had half the effective collision area compared to the perpendicular wings. The lesson from this calculation is therefore never bank and yank to avoid a mid-air collision threat. If you bank to perpendicular with your threat, you're doubling your size for a collision. The more better is to climb or dive wings level. If your killer wants your wingtips, make him come through the cockpit to get them. Wingtips are not sacrificial, sacrificial structural elements. These are uh, this is a list of, of many accidents where just wingtips were taken off by people who sometimes were even observed by witnesses banking the airplane just before collision. So Professor Shuck avoided being added to this list with his 2016 wings level dive away from the collision threat. From these areas on this chart, you can see that the PCAS pilot increased his target area 35% by banking even this small amount. If Mr. Pekes had used a wings level pull up to hide the area of his wings within his fuselage area, then he would have been much more likely to evade the midair collision that killed him as Professor Shuck did when he was successful with his wings level dive. The number density factor is also in the denominator of the mean free path formula with the same, with, with the area term, we, we, as with the area term, we want a smaller number density for longer mean free path and uh, less collision danger. Mm -hmm. So in 1995, I wrote a computer program that allowed me to count mid-air collisions from virtual aircraft obeying four mid-air collision safety alternatives or strategies that I wanted to compare. I started with a small model, 1,000 by 1,000 feet square by 2,000 feet high, and I modeled airplanes as spheres following these four rules. Spheres start at random locations headed in random directions to random destinations, flying only level, moving one quarter radius each time increment, and then any overlap between spheres would be counted as a, as a mid-air collision. So I had, uh, very quickly, I, had, I had, was, had quantitative evidence that the hemispheric cruising altitude rules required since 63 had very serious had a very serious system safety design defect, proving the FAA chief scientist Robert McCall's navigation paradox. The paradox was that accurately flown aircraft have more collisions, while inaccurate airplane craft, even random aircraft, might more likely pass each other with a vertical separation safety margin in direct direct proportion to pilot error in obeying the regulations. And I used uh, four sets of, uh, this, this chart shows the four sets of, uh, of rules, the four different rules that I tested. So my collision count data proved that perfectly accurate H car pilots were six times more dangerous than per purely random altitude pilots. Additionally, A car and A car variation pilots were always safer than purely random altitude pilots. The computer model results showed that mean closing velocities at counted collisions 
were about twice as fast for random and HCAR pilots compared to ACAR and ACAR variation pilots. In summary, I proved that ACAR and ACAR variation pilots would always be safer than random altitude pilots. Likewise, random altitude pilots would always be safer than HCAR pilots. Therefore, HCAR and ACAR variation pilots would always be way safer than hemispherical cruising altitude rule pilots. Okay, a NASA Ames Research Facility computer programming scientist for air traffic control computers, Russ Paley noticed my risk analysis article. He wrote his own airplane crashing program to independently test my conclusions. He didn't even wanna see my source code. He made his own program from scratch. He modeled a 500 nautical miles square airspace volume that was 10,000 feet tall and centered on Denver, uh, Denver Center with many programming design details far more elegant than my own collision counting program. His airspace model crashed virtual airplanes with similar enough results as compared with the results from my own model that he wrote, Pat Levaney's collision results are corroborated in this paper. How's that for hardcore science? This has been demonstrated, this thus it has been demonstrated that the grandfathers of our current FAA administrators in 1963 made a system safety technical error in their rulemaking process such that they inadvertently created a systematically dangerous mid-air collision hazard contrary to their presumed good intentions of creating a mid-air collision safety rule. I programmed my computer to also do a sensitivity study my sensitivity study counted virtual crashes at every piloting accuracy ranging from perfect accuracy all the way to sloppy accuracy at plus or minus 500 feet charted here representing a v-slop vertical maximum piloting error of 1000 feet so 1000 feet of v-slop is plus or minus 500 feet of piloting error i normalized the crash count data by dividing all collision counts by the counts for random pilots, thus making on this chart, the y-axis point of 1.0 equal to random altitude collision counts or representing at random altitude collision counts. So the, the ratios of all the other collision counts are measured above and below the 1.0 uh, unity factor for, for um, random collision counts. As mentioned before, the results with zero Z-slop showed that perfect H-car pilots crashed about six times more often than random pilots, while perfect A-car and RP, uh, perfect A-car pilots and A-car modification pilots expected about 20% fewer collisions than even random altitude pilots. Most importantly for fault tolerance, the full range of Z-slop piloting error showed that A-car and A-car variation pilots are always safer than both random altitude pilots and especially HCAR pilots. This relationship demonstrates the ACAR and ACAR variation fault tolerance need to avoid being on an intersecting flight path in the first place. So because of the sensitivity study proof, it shows that no matter how badly you might do a good thing like ACAR, it is worth doing badly because however badly you do so no matter how badly it's always safer in that entire length of the chart than obeying the uh, hemispheric cruising altitude rules of FARs 91.159 and 91.179. Okay uh, there's a one of the formulas I uh, derived from my 1995 paper was the probability of detection formula so so it it came from this idea of having uh, five seconds of visible time to impact on when I, when I almost had my own mid-air collision with my hangar partner. So as pilots, we dynamically gamble on the importance of focusing our time either inside or outside the cockpit. Detecting collision threats strongly depends on number one, what percentage of the time we look outside, and number two, how long the threat is actually visible before you run into them. Whenever the visible time to impact is less than the total time of the pilot's visual scan cycle from start to finish, it is impossible for any pilot, no matter how diligent or how experienced, to guarantee safety from a mid-air collision. This slide shows a graphical probability approximation when looking outside 100% of the time, 
scanning from side to side across 180 degrees forward arc with an 18 second scanning pattern looking for a fast threat with only five seconds of visible time to impact. The probability of detection here is about 5 18 or 28%. The probability of never seeing the threat is 13 18 or 72%. Those are bad odds. This is the probability of detection formula that I derived for calculating the odds of visually detecting a mid-air collision. This formula was, was published, peer reviewed, and it's the, and the result of this, whenever the result of this, the result of this formula is always less, whenever this formula is less than one, it's impossible for any pilot to guarantee a safe landing. You need a probability of, of 1.0 to, to show that you can guarantee seeing the other pilot before you run into them. So this example uses the five second visible threat that I experienced with, uh, with my own uh, mid-air collision avoidance. This, this example uses the probability of detection formula from the previous slide to, to with uh, side by side scanning covering 180 degrees and 18 seconds with a two second glance at the instrument panel. And here the probability of detecting the threat before impact is about 30%. So in my mid-air collision avoidance, I only had a 30% probability of detecting my, my threat, and I was just plain lucky. So this calculation uses Professor Shuck's 12 seconds of visible time to impact that he talked about in his uh, EAA webinar. Based on his 12 seconds, he had a 65% probability of detecting his threat. That's not a whole lot better. Double, but, uh, but still, it's not a guarantee. His safety was only slightly better than flipping a coin. Paul used the autopilot to allow him more time to look outside scanning for collision threats and that his, his scan outside helped him cheat the odds in his favor by depending on the autopilot to, to can handle the in-cock stuff. So let's compare these calculations for H-car pilots where the collision threat can come from any angle off the nose with the same collision for ACAR pilots where collisions can only come from one aircraft overtaking another dead ahead. So this is the, the uh, altimeter compass cruising altitude rule situation where you can only run into somebody that's at your altitude in your direction. Uh, you can't run in, people are at different altitudes or at a different angle and they're gonna miss you automatically. So with ACAR, you only need to scan a few dead, dead ahead 10 degree arcs where by design you expect to find slower ACAR aircraft at your altitude, instead of spending at least 18 seconds scanning 180 degrees for your collision threat horizon with H car, with H car A car, you only need to scan 10 or 10 or 20 degrees straight ahead for one or two seconds. With this short scan cycle, the probability of detecting even five second visible collision targets is maximized. In this example, this remember the remembering the formula we used before using the same uh, spreadsheet calculation with three 10 degree arcs, mostly dead ahead to detect a slower collision target, spending a total of three seconds looking outside with three seconds looking inside. This scanning pattern gives an answer of 100% detection probability. And in five seconds for, a, for overtaking somebody, that's kind of realistic. You have to really be scooting along at a tremendous speed to overtake somebody from the back in only five seconds. So in here, is the mirror collision that inspired three movies and resulted in the death of the only air traffic controller in aviation history ever killed because of his part in that accident. Two heavy transports converged over Germany with a 90 degree closing angle at the same altitude. They were going to collide obeying regulations requiring fixed common altitudes like those required by H car. If these aircraft had been flown at a car randomized altitudes, they would have automatically missed each other with a 250 foot altitude offset, even if the pilots were sleeping on autopilot, even if the air traffic controller was sleeping in his console, even if the TCAS system had their circuit breakers full turning them off, they would have still missed with a 250 vertical offset with the altimeter compass cruising altitude rule. Sky guide controller, Peter Nielsen, noticed the collision threat only in the last seconds before impact. And in his hurry to do something about it, he incorrectly ordered one pilot to dive contrary to that pilot's automated correct TCAS instruction to climb. The other pilot's also automatically correct TCAS instruction to dive resulted in both aircraft diving together to a common collision altitude. 
devastated father and husband of his dead wife and two children, Vitaly Kalyov, played by Arnold Schwarzenegger in the movie Aftermath, murdered Nielsen 603 days after the mid-air collision, thus making Nielsen the only air traffic controller to die following his contribution to the causes for a mid-air collision. Sadly, both Nielsen and Kalia bore their own fatal tragedies by an administrative root cause, recognizing NASA's administrative definition of root cause. Over five years before this 2002 German mid-air collision, I asked the FAA to fix their decades-old airspace design error with my request for notice of proposed rulemaking 28996. The administrator documented his administration, his, his administrative technical error by rejecting my NDRM 29996, dating his rejection only six days after 33 people would have been saved with any kind of random altitude flying at all, flying west of Namibia when our one of our C, uh, one, one of our uh, Air Force transport aircraft ran into a, a, a German transport aircraft and killed 33 people. So. So, um, in in the response to my in the in the in the in the response to my request, the the 1997 administrator said that my request was being closed because it did not have an immediate safety concern. So, how in the world could the 1997 administrator think that 33 fresh, freshly killed bodies, still unrecovered in the South Atlantic, still putrefying, still being eaten by sharks and bacteria, were not an immediate safety concern, but there it is on the letter saying, it's not an immediate safety concern, we're closing your NPRM. So when is a mid-air collision day ever an immediate safety concern for the FAA? After impact, when they have to dispatch an immediate, an NTSB team to look at shredded metal and meat. Even for the administrator's air traffic controllers, the only controller in history that ever died because of their causal contribution the mid-air collision took 603 days to be murdered. Certainly not an immediate uh, concern for, for, for the controller, but it's still tragic nonetheless. But uh, you know, that, that's how that worked out. So how could the 1975 and 1995 administrators have missed their own chief scientist whistleblowing, peer-reviewed, published hints about the navigation paradox, setting up the best, most accurate pilots for the most danger. So, um, in in my in my uh, 2018 EAA webinar, the webinar uh, presenter, the editor, used an online voting tool for pilot viewers to record their most favorite option for the safest cruising altitude regulations of the four I, anal I analyzed with virtual mid-air collisions. Notice the complexity of the published pilot aid for the, uh, for the modified ACAR version that gives a 1,000 feet of vertical offset. When all the votes were counted, the, the, uh, the, the webinar voters uh, voted 89% against hemispherical cruising after rules and 66% uh, voted for altimeter compass cruising altitude rule, 8% voted for the modified uh, ACAR that gives 1,000 feet of vertical offset, and 15% voted for random altitudes. So uh, pilots voted by a margin of eight to one in favor of the pilot-friendly ACAR formula with a 500-foot vertical separation over the con air, tra air traffic controller-friendly ACAR variation with a 1,000-foot head-on vertical offset that required a pilot aid with confusing uh, complexity. Even voters, voters even preferred purely random altitudes over the FARs by 15% uh, to, uh, uh, to 11%. So even pure random uh, v flying one over the hemisphere cruising altitude rules. I met Dr. Michael Griffin, former NASA administrator, on an elevator ride at Marshall Space Flight Center after he gave a talk about lessons learned in independent technical authority. 
during my elevator speech to the, to the, uh, to the lobby, I explained to Dr. Griffin about what we just talked about. And when we got it all finished, he, he said that, uh, that he suggested that HCAR is nothing more than a sorting strategy for the convenience of air traffic control. Since he, he tend to agree that it's not a safety rule, but it, it's, it's the only thing it's doing, it's acting like some kind of sorting strategy. And when I told him about the ACAR idea, he said, that's a very clever idea. So uh, uh, here are some quotes relating to safety focused priority of accounting for unbending natural laws uh, compared to tolerating a natural regulations designed as administrative sorting strategies in conflict with natural physical reality. And here's the first of two slides from the 2018 EA webinar requested by chat comments to be shown at length during the question and answer phase later. So these safety recommendations are, are written by design to be 100% compliant with all aviation safety regulations, including the HCAR hemispherical cruising altitude rules. So considering uh, altitude inaccuracy allowed for both private and pilot pilots, we're allowed to be a little bit off. And using these ideas in this slide, you can obey the rules and still add to your safety by not being so accurate, obeying rules that have been unsafe for decades. This, this is the second slide uh, people wanted to see a lot of afterwards. And uh, these recommendations have little to do with the HCAR FARs. However, they can lengthen your lifespan. These recommendations help pilots avoid common altitudes as if they were flying too much like boats on a lake for like uh, Lake 7,000 feet or late 7,500 feet or Lake 8,000 feet and so on. These, these ideas here will help you avoid mid-air collisions. So the conclusion is that the uh, blame the pilot is the go-to cause for even accident investigations that might recognize the unappreciated, peer-reviewed, repeatedly published navigation paradox wisdom of their own chief scientists. When, when Las Vegas is setting up the game for their gambling guests, they always rig the game for promoting the building of more expensive hotels and infrastructure. Las Vegas cares nothing about sending their gambling customers home with more wealth than they brought. They want Las Vegas customers to be bankrupt sooner rather than later. In contrast, I want all my pilot friends to die of old age, surrounded by family and friends, rather than in some smoking crater, surrounded by flaming shredded wreckage. When will international aviation safety administrators start using physics-based laws for the comfort and longevity of their pilots and passengers? So uh, if we had to color code danger arcs on our altimeters, the way we do our airspeed indicators, for VA, for, for VX and VY and stuff like that. This slide shows how altimeters might be marked for cruising with H car and A car. The red bands show we expect to collide with altitude accurate autopilots and drones. The orange bands show where you expect to collide with hand flying IFR rated pilots. The yellow bands show we expect to collide with novice private pilots. And the safest possible green bands with H car with H car are very small arc for H car and they're, they're illegal to use for cruising more than 3000 feet above the ground. However, the green band for A car goes all the way around the altimeter scale protecting all pilots equally well, regardless of what combo setting they are flying. And most importantly, regardless of how accurately they are able to fly the H car formula. So as aviators, it's our privilege and challenge to navigate in three dimensions. There is no good excuse for aviators to be looking for trouble at common altitudes. And that's all I have to say. Thank you, Robert. I'm gonna open up uh, anybody that has any questions for Robert, go ahead. All right. I have, I got some questions, I'll tell you that. Um, with the ADSB system going on, can, is there something in by the manufacturers that maybe they're going to integrate it with the autopilot for collision avoidance? Is that something anybody's heard about or coming down the coming down the pikes or in the works? I don't know. I know TCAS already does that, but uh, it, it could be done for ADSB. But uh, ADSB is is uh, something that uh, I use. I'm happy to use it. 
on the the aircraft that I fly, but uh, it's 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 not it not it doesn't always work, and it doesn't always keep people from uh, uh, flying together. And, and in fact, one of my friends at uh, Huntsville, Alabama, was kind of the the uh, RV expert at hooking up all the airplanes with the uh, ADSB, and he would go visit people in Atlanta. And Atlanta Airport, the main airport in Atlanta, for over a month would not was had something wrong and ADSB wasn't working at all for nobody could see where anybody was for over a month and uh, and so so ADSB is is a wonderful thing but uh, sometimes the ground facilities that are required to support it uh, aren't aren't reliable to to do that so okay the other thing that i wrote down and in, incorrect in, in i hope i got it right but i think what you were saying on one of the slides <clears throat> If you see a collision, for collision avoidance, you want to do a wings level dive or a wings level climb. You don't want to bank because the bank makes you a bigger target. Was that correct? Yes, that's exactly right. Okay. Yeah, there, there are some, some of those, some of those uh, collisions that I put on that list, the, the, the wing tips were on the ground together and one airplane was way off to the one side and one airplane was way over to the other side. So they had actually traded wingtips, the wingtips fell straight down in the middle, and the uh, two airplanes continued with their momentum to separate crash sites. Oh my. Now, on the screen, you get the A car, and you have the, um, the green circle, which goes around 360 degrees. Right. And I'm trying to, from what you are explaining, say I'm on a heading of 010. And that would be just to the right of the north. So I'd be right. right at northeast approximately. And I'm not sure I understand. Say I'm flying at 6,000 feet. So are you saying that I do 6,100 feet? Yes, that's exactly right. So if, you're okay. 100, if your 100 foot hand is pointing toward that one, you would want to fly at 6,100 feet. If your 100 foot hand is pointing to the two, you'd want to fly at 6,200 feet. So if, okay. You know, all right, I want to make sure I understood how that worked because yeah. I, I know we're all on the uh, we're all trained on the HCAR. Right, sure. From, so from, so fly, from yeah, flying north, you fly at flying north, you fly at a thousand foot intervals. Flying south, you fly at five hundred foot intervals, and, and so on. So all the right. way around. So at your beginning, when you were showing all, it makes sense. It really does make sense when you think about it that. You, you got all this randomness and, and random is, is better than uh, what we were saying earlier, but from an ATC standpoint, I see what you're saying is that they have all that randomness going on in the radar screen is probably, probably it's, a little- It's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable for air traffic control to have random people flying at random yeah. altitudes, but yeah. their, their bacon's not in the frying pan. So what the system should have been designed from 1945 to 1963, all the way back to 1928, the system is supposed to be designed to be comfortable for pilots. And if random pilots being safer is uncomfortable for ATC, that's their problem. We mm. should be flying, they should be, who's the customer here? Are we, are we shedding blood? As customers for the for our air traffic control people to be comfortable, or are they supposed to be dealing with us being as safe as possible? You know, who's who's the customer? Are we flying with our passengers who are supposed to be going safely from here to there? Are we are we the ones that are supposed to be comfortable, or are they supposed to be comfortable with people flying with unsafe regulations that are easy for them to to sort? Yeah. Now I, I saw, I visited the Denver Tracon uh, a couple months ago. We had a tour there and we got to go in and see the radars, the, the, the scopes and the screens that everybody's looking at. And they do have the capability if there's something converging, they, it'll come up on the screen and it'll tell them there's a conflict, uh, so to speak. Uh, sure. But as far as randomness, that's an it's a interesting concept. I can, I understand it. Um, I don't, it's very interesting. Um, where is the FAA's position today on this? Well, their final answer was to reject my notice of proposed rulemaking 
28996 mm -hmm. and uh, they have never changed that now this is really crazy because that that picture that i showed you of of five aircraft from a side view and a plan view that picture was playing for two and a half days at 800 independence avenue in washington dc in federal aviation headquarters during a drone conference mm -hmm. i helped a aircraft data simulation company show off their product by flying airplanes at ACAR altitudes. They had actually six airplanes flying for two and a half days. Every 30 seconds, they'd come around and they'd come together and then they'd miss each other and they would go on. And there were a lot of FAA people over there. There were a lot of NTSB people over there. They all saw this thing. I talked in person to two NTSB chairman they were board members when i talked to them but each one of them i talked to them for 15 minutes in person face to face three feet apart showing them my paper showing them this these 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 uh these graphics and showing them said look this is something i proved there's a problem why don't you go and fix this thing and, and help people uh, save themselves with random altitude flying instead of flying all together uh, looking for love in all the wrong places and and they all they all understood it uh, you know, both both NTSB uh, board members who would later become chairman, they both understood it completely, but neither one of them did anything about it. One of them wrote in a letter back to me that that we just we, we just make recommendations to the FAA. We don't tell them what to do to fix problems. We just recommend solutions. And and I thought that was that made me scratch my head. So. Mm -hmm. So how much more can you, what more can you do to have a NASA scientist say your, your results are corroborated? You could go stand in front of them in FAA headquarters and say, here's the problem. You know, why, why won't we fix this? You know, and, right. and uh, so, so that was like a 2008 at a, at yeah. a, at a safety seminar. Hmm. Now you, you talked about the five second, 30% probability, 12 seconds, 65% probability. And then I wrote the five second, 100% probability, but I missed the um, who did it and why did it differ from the previous two? Could you explain that a little bit? Sure, sure, sure. So, so when you're flying by hemispherical cruising altitude rules, you got to scan from wingtip to wingtip. You know, you got to scan the whole 180 degrees outside there. So you take 20 seconds if you're if you're looking there and 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 you're supposed to look for one to two seconds so that your chemistry your vision chemistry can 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 resolve the image and put it in your brain it takes one to two seconds and i was just doing one second on my formula so so with one second um uh, it's it's 30 percent with a five second closing but but for a five second closing where you're only looking there there and there if you only have to look straight ahead, then you don't have to, you can look here, 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 and a five second closing will be detectable. But if you're, if you're looking over here and a five second closing comes from the right, if you're looking to the left and a five second closing comes from the right, you won't even see it before you swapped paint. Oh. Okay. And that is, that's exactly what happened over by Mile High Stadium. Mile High Stadium had the same geometry as I had. They had a, a turboprop twin Cheyenne closing on a Cessna 172. And uh, they hit over there by uh, about 2002 or so. And they had the same class of aircraft conflict that I had when I went up against a turboprop uh, beach super king air it was the same general performance class so so i had about five seconds of visible time to impact because i was looking exactly where i need to be look be looking since i was cheating i was cheating i was tail charlie guy on the formation i was looking at my hangar partner all the time 100 percent of the time i was looking right at him so i didn't run into him mm -hmm. and the the uh, the threat showed up a little dot showed up right over his canopy and the dot sprouted twin engines and outboard wing panels and then it became a, a beach uh, super king air. And so at five seconds, I had time to, to pull up into a 4G climb and holler at my hangar partner, pull up. And he had less time than me. 
and he saw the visible rivets go by. He saw the sunglasses on the guy's face. He saw the little epaulet, epaulets on the guy's aviation uh, uniform. So he, he didn't have as much time as I had, but he, he missed only because I told him to pull up and he didn't feel like doing a vertical formation with me. So he pushed down the same as Dr. Shuck pushed down and he missed with rivet visible uh, proximity to that Super King Air. Right. Wow. Okay. All right. More questions from the audience. Robert, this is Rick. Uh, first off, I wanted to thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, fascinating. I love the analysis and I love the insights. Uh, two things. One is I was wondering if you'd be willing to share slides or at least reshow the what can pilots do and remain legal to uh, Ooh, make yes, themselves sure. safer slides. Uh, the other question is, what do you do about areas where you can't uh, easily make changes. So for example, uh, patterns uh, where everyone's likely to be at the same uh, altitude. Traffic patterns are a whole new thing. That's uh, like uh, that's like the PhD level of ACAR. So we're, we're dealing with the, with the uh, high school math level of, of ACAR. And in traffic patterns, because when you're flying, let's say you're climbing, let's say you just, you're going to climb, you're, you're, your, your 100 foot hand spins circles to the right. And when you're di descending, you're gliding down, your, your 100 foot hand spins to the left. You can actually set up an air, a complicated aircraft, aircraft traffic area where all the downwinds have their own ACAR cruising altitude and where people would descend in left turns following their 100 foot hand in an ACAR continuous formula. And they would climb in right-hand turns with a continuous ACAR climb, and you could have a, a complicated air space. So with, uh, with the altimeter compass, with altimeter compass cruising altitude rule, it actually works for climbing to the right and descending to the left. And you can have an, a traffic pattern where all the downwinds for all the different runways are at different altitudes depending on their, their heading angle. So, so you could imagine all the gears in a, in a transmission uh, meshing without breaking each other, breaking off the teeth. You could have a an A car traffic pattern where people fly A car and climbing right turns and descending left turns. And the only place where they would have a chance of running into each other would be on short final, where you have to de depart from formula separation to depart to having everybody on the same glide slope. So, so the short final with everybody on the same, same glide slope would still be a problem, but you could uh, imagine a complicated airspace with a car for, for people departing and climbing to the right and descending and landing to the left. And, and you could still maintain a car in a uh, complicated thing. I didn't really want to mention that in the, to the FAA, but that's a, that's a possibility that could be used for, for example, drones. You know, if drones are doing pizza deliveries or pharmacy deliveries or something like that. You could schedule drones to fly uh, computer control climb to the right. And I actually did that with a simulator. It took me about six times before I could master an ACAR climb to the right to a descending left turn back to the <clears throat> flight simulator. It's not easy to do. No. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience tonight? Floor is open. Uh, all right. No. All right. Robert, uh, I want to thank you again. That was a, uh, it's going to give me something to think about, definitely, from uh, what you were saying here. Uh, very interesting from a mathematical and scientific stand, standpoint. Uh, ran, random altitudes. I'm going to have to think about that one. All right. No, very good. Thank you, everyone, for attending. I appreciate it. If you're not CPA members, uh, please join and help our organization in advanced aviation in the state of Colorado.